Welcome to Net Zero. I'm Nahid perez -Ayal. Carbon capture and carbon storage technologies have been around for decades and are recognized as innovative ways to reduce carbon emissions, which could be key to helping the world tackle global warming. So why haven't they taken off? Daniel Strag is the Sturgis Cooper Professor of Geology at Harvard University, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering, and Director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Net Zero, it's an honor to welcome Daniel Strag. So considering the impact on oil and gas supply because of the Ukraine invasion, what adjustments, if any, should be made by governments regarding their COP26 commitments? The major COP26 commitments are the, the ones that are in the distant future, 2050, 2060, 2070. I hope that those won't change. I think it's important to have those aggressive aspirations. I also think it's very important to understand that no country is on track to meet those aspirations. So we need to accelerate our efforts enormously. I think the major impact of the war in Ukraine is that geopolitics of energy has reared its head. We care about the security of supply. And of course, politically all over the world, because oil and gas prices have gone up enormously, there's a big populist concern about the high prices and politicians all over the world are trying to fix that by lowering prices somehow. And unfortunately, their reaction in the US and Europe has been to focus on supply, to focus on finding new sources of oil and gas. Very little has been said about demand. And I actually think that this is the very important piece of the puzzle. I would like, for example, to see, you know, if we could accelerate the transition to electric vehicles all over the world by incentivizing new factories being built. We can't change oil demand with EVs in the next six months, but over the next three years, we could make a significant difference and start to lower oil prices for the long run. And in the long run, that's how you hurt Russia. So the government has received numerous criticisms, but it also seems to currently be our best approach using economic incentives to reduce global warming. So why do you think that the initial idea hasn't involved much in light of the criticisms? I think the basic idea of putting a price on carbon, every economist will tell you it's the most efficient, best way to reduce emissions, partly because it doesn't pick any technology. It lets technologies compete because what matters is performance. You are saying here is the price on carbon and whoever has the best technology to lower carbon emissions is going to win. From a policy perspective, this makes perfect sense. Politically, it turns out it's very difficult, partly because people don't understand it and partly because there's a lot of very powerful vested interests, the existing fossil fuel industry, that really don't want to change in the U.S. and all over the world. What was the idea behind establishing a coal reservoir for our planet and how will it address worldwide pressure points? Coal is responsible for a little less than half of global emissions of CO2. And it is by far the dirtiest fuel, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions per unit energy, but also in terms of conventional pollution and its effects on public health. Burning coal is just bad for people's health, and we should stop using it. Unfortunately, there are many countries around the world, including China, including India, that are utterly dependent on coal use right now. It is playing a smaller and smaller role in our energy system, but we still use it. It is cheap, but that's partly because we don't force people to pay for the environmental consequences consequences of burning it. In my view, we have to eliminate coal use. The idea of a global coal reservoir or a global coal budget to use, it's an interesting concept. I'm not sure it's very effective. I think people can come up with various types of budgets for how much fossil fuel we can use to stay under a any target like one and a half degrees or two degrees, but the world fundamentally isn't bound by those budgets or those targets. It was a wonderful aspiration and it's just not realistic with the way the world is trending. How did your experience as President Obama's advisor change your insight and perspectives on the carbon problem? Working for President Obama with his other members of the Council of Advisors on Science and Technology was an incredible learning experience for me. There were experts from, from many different fields and also trying to understand how the effective in government was an incredible education in, in learning about diplomacy and also learning about building coalitions and building consensus to actually get something done. We were empowered by President Obama himself, who took an interest in our advice. I also learned how difficult it is to move forward on some of these policies. Actually making any progress at all on climate, very challenging because there are all sorts of different constituencies, not just the fossil fuel industry, but a variety of other industries. And so trying to move forward is very, very challenging, even if the president of the United States is very committed to this, which he was. 
What policies do you think should take priority for the world to achieve net zero? The reality is that different parts of the world are moving at different paces. I think it's the responsibility of some of the larger economies to take a serious role in moving technologies forward as they transition to becoming cheaper and better. For example, around the world now, at least at low penetration, solar and wind are cheaper than just about any other form of electricity generation. And that means you don't have to try to twist the arm of countries, say, in sub-Saharan Africa to build wind and solar. They will build it because it's cheaper than any alternative. It's better. We're not quite there yet with electric vehicles, but I think in the next decade, we will be, where electric vehicles will be cheaper than internal combustion engine vehicles. So to me, that's a path forward where countries can try to accelerate this technological learning to bring prices down and make them more competitive. On the other hand, there are some parts of our energy system that are going to be very difficult to decarbonize. And that's where not just research and development, but also countries like the US need to invest in pilot plants and, and experimental deployment of technologies that may be more expensive, but in the long run are going to be necessary. And, and that's where some political willpower is needed from the public. The public ultimately have to be willing to pay the extra cost of clean energy. So the question is, when will the public's willingness to pay grow to the level that will support those technologies? Thank you, Professor Daniel Surak, for joining us at Net Zero today. I'm Najib Lesayala, and I add my voice to the voices of my Net Zero international youth leaders to monitor the actions of our world's leaders to achieve Net Zero commitments. Together, we can achieve Net Zero.